Hey everyone and welcome to Learn A-Level Biology for Free with Ms Estrick. In this video we're going on to the final stage of in vivo cloning and that is how you can identify transformed cells. If you haven't seen the other two then click the cards at the top, I'll put one here and one on the next slide. I'll also link them at the end also. So just to show you how far we've gone through, so we've already looked at creating the DNA fragments and that is how you isolate the gene that you want to clone. We've also looked at how you can then create lots of copies of those in in vivo cloning. But what we haven't looked at yet is how you can identify which bacteria have taken up your DNA that is going to make your clone. So in other words, if we have a look at all the stages here, these are the last two steps that we're going to go through in today's lesson. So how you can identify which bacteria cells have taken up your vector, which will be the plasmid, and then how you grow them on mass to get lots of copies. So identifying transformed cells. The reason you have to have this step is not all of the bacteria will successfully incorporate or take up the recombinant plasmid. And there's three key reasons for this. So the first one is the recombinant plasmid sometimes doesn't get inside of the cell. Even though you've increased the permeability of the membrane, sometimes it doesn't get in. And in fact, it is most of the time it won't get in. The second issue is when you come to make your recombinant plasmid, sometimes the plasmid will rejoin and stick back together before the DNA fragment that you've isolated enters. And the final issue can be that the DNA fragment that you isolated might actually just stick to itself and create a really small loop. And again, it doesn't make a recombinant plasmid. So we have to identify which bacteria have taken up the recombinant plasmid before we then grow the bacteria en masse. So that is what we mean by identifying transformed cells. And there's three key methods that are used for this. They all involve using a marker gene. And what we mean by that is within the plasmid, there is a gene which can create a protein, which will then enable you to identify which bacteria contain the plasmid. And the three different marker genes which are used are antibiotic resistance genes. And more commonly now is using genes that code for, for fluorescence and enzymes, because these are much quicker methods. So the antibiotic resistance method, what you would do is the bacterial plasmid, you'd have to make sure you insert in a gene that makes the bacteria resistant to the antibiotic tetracycline and also the gene to make it resistant to the antibiotic ampicillin. Next, we'll then need to insert into the plasmid the DNA fragment that we've isolated that we want to clone. So in this case, it's been inserted in and it's deliberately inserted in the middle of the tetracycline gene. And what that will do is that tetracycline gene is disrupted, so it's no longer going to be able to create the protein which makes the bacteria resistant to tetracycline. So in other words, any bacteria that contains this recombinant plasmid will not be resistant to the antibiotic tetracycline. It will still be resistant to ampicillin though, because that gene is completely unaltered. So next we grow the um, bacteria. And first of all, we just grow them on agar. And what I'm demonstrating here is all the different individual colonies that grew on the agar. The next step though is we need to work out out of these colonies of bacteria, which of them successfully took up the recombinant plasmid. So step one is we use a sterile velvet block and you place this sheet all the way over the front of your Petri dish and then you stamp it onto a Petri dish which contains agar but ambicillin antibiotic dissolved within it as well. And then we'll leave it for a couple of days to see which of the original colonies can now grow. And any of the colonies that do still grow what that tells us is it must have the plasmid inside of it because it has that gene making it resistant to ambicillin and therefore they are able to grow even though we have the ambicillin antibiotic. 
So the final step is, all that has told us is it contains the plasmid, but we don't know if it contains this original plasmid or the recombinant plasmid. So the last step is we then use the sterile velvet block again, take the imprint this time and put it onto a final Petri dish, which has tetracycline antibiotic dissolved within the agar. And now we can see which colonies can still grow. And if they are colonies that grew on ambicillin and tetracycline, that means they must be resistant to tetracycline and ambicillin. So any colonies that are still growing on that final Petri dish must be the original plasmid, which does not contain the gene of interest. So we can now look back at our second Petri dish and we can see that colony E and G, they grow on ambicillin, but they don't grow on tetracycline. So colonies E and G must be bacteria that contain the recombinant plasmid. So we've now identified that E and G are the colonies of bacteria which contain the plasmid of interest. So we then take those colonies and grow them further. So that's method one. The other two methods are fairly similar, but more straightforward. So fluorescent markers, this actually comes from jellyfish. So some jellyfish naturally create a protein which is green and fluorescent. So we call it GFP, green fluorescent protein. So that gene that naturally occurs in jellyfish has been isolated and inserted into a bacteria plasmid. So that's what we're showing here. We've got our bacteria plasmid, and this time, instead of using antibiotic resistant markers, we're using this fluorescent protein gene as our marker. Again, we've got our DNA fragment, which we've isolated, and we're going to insert it into the plasmid, but deliberately right in the middle of our marker gene. So that means any bacteria which take up the recombinant DNA plasmid will not be able to produce that green fluorescent protein because the gene is disrupted. So we then grow the bacteria on agar and if you then expose the colonies to UV light, the ones that have the GFP gene still intact, they glow and you can see these fluorescent glowing colonies. All of the others that you can see here which aren't glowing they must be bacteria which contain the recombinant plasmid because the gene's been disrupted so they no longer produce that green protein. So those would be the colonies, the ones that aren't glowing, the ones that you would take to grow further. So the last example is enzyme markers and we're looking at the enzyme lactase. And lactase can turn a certain substance blue in colour from its original colourless solution. So that gene for the enzyme lactase is inserted into the plasmid, much like we've looked at in the previous two examples. Then we need to put the DNA fragment of interest right in the middle of that lactase gene to disrupt it. So now any bacteria which are going to be grown on this um, colourless substance, um, if they have the recombinant plasmid in them, they will not be able to produce lactase to turn the substance blue. So that's exactly what you do. You grow the bacteria on this colourless substance and any colonies which cannot turn that colourless substance blue must have had that lactase enzyme gene disrupted. So that means they contain the plasmid of interest. So those would be the ones that you'd collect. So the last step is now you have your bacteria which contain your recombinant plasmid and therefore the section of DNA that you want to clone, you need to make lots and lots of copies of that bacteria. So we grow them in fermenters, which are these industrial machines here, where you can control the temperature and the nutrients that you provide so you get lots and lots of copies of that bacteria and they'll all be clones. And because they're all clones, they will all contain the gene of interest. So they'll be able to produce lots of the protein that you are after. So one common example is the gene for insulin might have been the gene that you've inserted into your plasmid, which then goes into your bacteria. 
we then grow lots of that bacteria in the fermenter and those bacteria will produce lots of the insulin protein from that gene. So that's why we call it in vivo cloning. We have cloned that piece of DNA in a living organism. That's what in vivo means, in the living organism. So I hope you found that helpful. If you have, please give it a thumbs up and click the subscribe button. Um, and if you want some practice questions, head over to missestric.com.